Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the live Q&A with me Professor Michael Scott on Thursday the 28th of February. How can we be at the end of February already? Well just to jazz us up we've had a nice couple of days of sunshine it's got a bit wet again today so to jazz us up we've got this new background behind me today uh, not my choice I kind of walked in to find uh, the room where I do the Q&A kind of completely redecorated this week with this kind of rather exciting pattern so I hope you don't lose me in amongst all the uh, inverted triangles and C design I think is probably how we might describe it um, but it's lovely to have you with us this afternoon and we've got some great questions in from you as always first off thank you always for sending in your questions it's absolutely essential to the whole business of what we're here doing here in these live q and a's to answer your questions about the ancient world so do please keep them coming in always via email to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com or you can send them in via the facebook page or indeed we've had a question in via instagram this week as well so absolutely fantastic but please 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 keep in coming in those questions uh, and uh, i absolutely love reading them thinking about the answers and sharing them with you and discussing with you in these live q and a's so we will get kicked off hi Shirley, how are you doing hi judith hi claire how are you doing Great that the video also seems really clear this week. We haven't got any fuzz appearing on the video screen, so that's all good. We are all set for a great half hour. Um, we've had a great question in from Sarah Scotty, who asks, are there any examples of golden age thinking in the classical age? Now, what I take from this, Sarah, is that you're asking about in antiquity, in the classical world, so ancient Greece, two and a half thousand years ago, did they ever think about... Um, eras of their own past as being a kind of golden age of when everything was great and perfect in the way that we tend to think about ancient Greece as a golden age in the bigger story of humanity and human civilization. 60s wallpaper is what you're calling this. Ouch, 60s wallpaper. I don't know, I have to, I have to tell you, I wasn't alive in the 60s to know what wallpaper was like back then. Uh, neither, I'm sure, were you. Can't be a day over 25, I'm sure. Uh, hi, Hugh, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Willow, lovely to see you. Great to see you at the Open Day, Warwick Open Day as well last week. And thank you to you all, obviously, as well, for tuning in to the uh, inaugural lecture last week. I hope that you enjoyed that as well. It was great, great fun to do it. I totally get that we had some sound issues with the Facebook Live uh, video that the microphone, the phone was a lot further away from me than uh, it normally is with a live Q&A. So we're going to have to have a think about that um, if we do uh, further Facebook Live big uh, lecture events in the future and we'll try and rectify that. So thanks for your feedback. Um, yes, so Sarah, a great question about golden age thinking in the classical age. And yes, it's absolutely the case uh, that um, very soon after the 5th century BCE, so the supposed golden age of uh, Athenian democracy, Athenian empire, the great works, and particularly the great works of drama of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, just the next century on, the 4th century BCE, by which time the Athenians had lost their empire, um, they'd lost their democracy for a short period of time and had come back, but the Athenians were in a much more uncertain world in which they were no longer in charge of everything, nor really the most powerful uh, kid on the block, that they almost automatically started looking back and canonising and thinking about what had happened to them in the previous century and setting it up as uh, what we might call a golden age. So particularly thinking about drama and the theatre, um, they started re-performing plays. This was quite an unusual thing. Normally plays had been produced, written for a particular competition in a particular year, and then the great playwrights went, went on and wrote more of them. They might be uh, re-performed re in other theatres or in other parts of the Greek world, so over in Sicily, for instance, but very unusual for them to be re-performed in Athens. But in the 4th century BC, you start to see the canonization of the great writers of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides and the re-performance of their best plays, however we might want to define that. Hello, Iskra from Sofia. How are you doing? Hi, Bieber from York. Um, so it's specifically kind of within the realm of the theatre in Athens in the 4th century, you already get this idea of harking back to a golden age of drama that everyone is being uh, treated to once again in the 4th century. Hi, Tan, how are you going? Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and increasingly, as the 4th century goes on, you see, uh, and indeed uh, centuries after that, as Athens has to find its way within an ever increasingly big world of big empires of which it is just one tiny city and then indeed as part of the Roman Empire Athens often 
trades back on that reputation of what Athens was like during the 5th century BC in its golden age, inviting people to be part of that. Um, and again, it comes down to the theatre. So one of the things that Athens does in later centuries is sell its citizenship. You could buy citizenship of ancient Athens, be part of the story um, of the golden age city of Athens and you could get front row seats in the theatre uh, in Athens to be part of that historical moment and place um, and call yourself a member of that city. So Athens very much trades for survival in later centuries by harking back to the great things it had achieved um, in its golden age of the fifth century. Good afternoon or good afternoon. Bertrand, how are you doing? Was the Saxon shield or infantry strategy taken from the Romans? Oh, I don't know much about the Saxons. Does anyone know much about the Saxons uh, online? Tell us if you do, Bertrand, the Saxon shield wall. We'll have to investigate that a little bit further. I don't have an answer for you right away, I'm afraid. That'll be a fun question to have a think about. Um, I kind of the uh, kind of thing. Do please send me an email about this. Send me an email to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com and we can do a bit of research for a future week to come back with an answer for the question. But thank you indeed uh, for posting it online now. Um, so thanks, Sarah, for a great question about was there a golden age in kind of in antiquity, as it were. Um, and it reminded me also when we were filming the Egypt programme uh, for Ancient Invisible Cities. Um, and we were sitting in Cairo uh, and thinking about when the Romans were engaged in Cairo and how they must have been thinking and, and reacting to the monuments of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, the great pyramids at Al, which were older to them in time, to the Romans at that point in time, back in the sort of first century BC AD, than the Romans are to us today. I think that's an incredible idea to get your head around that those in the ancient past were themselves confronted with an ancient past that was just as uh, old as, as, the, as the Greeks and Romans are to us today. And how must they have understood that and come across that um, and, and engage with that idea of, of the humanity they couldn't investigate in the same way, um, but which made it very, very clear um, that humanity had been walking in these, in these places for a long period of time creating and achieving amazing things. So, kind of absolutely fantastic question, Sarah. Thank you for that. Um, we've had another great question um, from Shavini Kure, uh, which is, what advice would you give to a young person who is passionate to take up history at university but doesn't necessarily get the support from their family due to it being seen, history being seen as kind of not going to lead to a job, etc., etc., etc.? So, Shavini, thank you very much for your very brave and bold question. Um, I think that's really, really important uh, to kind of confront head on, particularly in the UK world and the world of UK universities and the UK job market. Because one of the fundamental things that I hear all the time from employers uh, across a huge range of careers, kind of accepting maybe the hard sciences and say medicine, is that they're not necessarily interested in um, the subject matter that you have studied at university. There isn't a prerequisite. There isn't a subject they're going to kind of write off and say, no, you can't possibly do a job with us in our company. What they are interested in, particularly in the UK, is how well you've done in that degree. Uh, have you kind of done a great job? You know, have you got a good result? And uh, have, have you been doing that degree at a, a well-reputed uh, reputation, a university with a good reputation? So uh, my response in that scenario is that it is absolutely crucial for you to be picking a subject to study at university that you enjoy the most. Because a subject you enjoy the most, you're going to do your best at. You're going to get the best possible result. And it's that great result that is going to stand you in the best of stead for getting a great job afterwards. So my response kind of would be on two levels. Firstly, we can show there's tons of data. Have a look at some of the data coming out of the British Academy or the Royal Historical Society about kind of the myriad of amazing jobs that historians, both of modern history and ancient history, go on to do. Everything from teaching to civil service to law to accountancy, finance uh, to diplomacy, uh, civil service, and so the list goes on into media as well, as well as into further research. But also then make the point that you need to achieve your best possible result 
It's the degree result that's going to be important. And you'll do that doing a subject that you really enjoy. So fight for what you can enjoy, what you really enjoy, what you really love doing. And don't let anyone dissuade you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, kind of really, really great that you could join us. Thank you again. And let's all give our support, I think, to Shivini for the courage to ask that question. Um, um, I remember, too, when I was thinking... Uh, about studying classics at university. It was a kind of last minute decision. I was gonna go off and become a lawyer. It was all sorted and clear um, within a family context that where my brother had studied classics, but uh, kind of my parents hadn't. And I too had to um, kind of think about how to talk to them about this subject being something that I wanted to do. And I was very, very lucky that they were incredibly supportive of once they understood it was something I was passionate about, that I should uh, go forward and continue with it. Um, and I think we should be absolutely um, kind of behind every step of the way. Anyone who's got the guts to say, I'm passionate about this, this is something I want to do. So Shivini, great job. Keep it up, keep coming back. Tell us what you decide. Tell us what you end up doing at university, um, kind of thing. Alex says, good afternoon. Tell me, are you doing another program on ancient Greece soon? Ah, well, with a kind of, I can't possibly confirm what's in the works at the moment. Although lots of discussions are underway. I'm deep in term at the moment at Warwick University. So uh, kind of I'm full time at the university and that's my main job kind of work as a professor teaching and researching there. Um, and so I only get um, relatively few chances to film um, outside of term time uh, when I'm not going to be absent from the term when I need to be there on a daily basis. Uh, so it's about finding the right project that fits in at the right time of year uh, for me to be able to film. <laughs> Latif, I'm glad you're enjoying the trippy background. Ooh, we're kind of exactly brilliant. Um, Hugh's asking a prof was teaching always your aim no no I was never intending to be a classicist or a teacher I was always going to go on and become a lawyer um, and then one of the great things about law as a subject kind of or as a future career is you, there are no kind of necessary subjects you need to study at school for it certainly let alone at university so I was lucky enough to have been exposed to some ancient Greek when I was young and I loved it very much and so I carried on studying it um, I gave up Latin had no interest in Latin no interest in, in kind of going on to class um, and then I had my, we went on a school trip to Greece when I was 17 and uh, I had my 17th birthday in the sanctuary of Olympia exploring the ancient ruins of Greece and, and that for me was a, was a kind of light bulb moment where I just went, oh, you know, there's something about this culture which really fascinates me. And so I sort of tore up my UCAS application forms for law and came home and said, I'm going to um, apply to read classics at university and, and study the ancient world for a little bit longer. So kind of uh, that's what led me to read classics. I still had no concept that I was going to go on to become a teacher, researcher, professor at university. Um, it wasn't until I was doing an MPhil and I then spent about three months based out in Athens at the British School of Athens, which is the, the, the research institute, which kind of helps everyone based in British universities work and research and engage with ancient Greece and indeed uh, research into modern Greece uh, and I utterly fell in love with the concept of researching, teaching and studying um, the ancient world there and from that point on never looked back. Uh, so kind of there we go, that's the, kind of my story of how I ended up getting into it, in, into, into what I do today and I think it's kind of one that we could all parallel in the sense that uh, we should never really think that we either are our journeys, our kind of pathways are fixed, right? We never know what is around the corner. We never know what decisions can lead to. Um, and to be open to the different opportunities and possibilities that could take you off on a tangent tomorrow um, and change the directions that uh, that your lives go in. Um, on that note, actually, we've had a really interesting question um, that came in over Instagram uh, this week. So Instagram, if you don't follow me on Instagram, it's uh, at Prof MC Scott, just like my Twitter hashtag as well. Um, so do follow on Instagram for kind of uh, photos, behind the scenes photos, uh, and other kind of things that are that are interesting me on a daily basis. Um, kind of hello, yeah, <laughs> Alex is super glad you didn't become a lawyer. Uh, so am I. I have to say, like, kind of uh, thank you very much, Jacob, as well. So the question that came in, I don't know your full name. I only know you by your Instagram account. So if you're listening, tell us, tell us your name. Apples Catherine Seven. Apples Catherine Seven on Instagram asked this question in response to a photo and uh, a flag about about this Q and A today. That sort of talk about. Could you tell us about one historical event and how differently the world would have turned out had that event not happened? Right? What would you choose? What would be your event? What a great question! That kind of what if counterintuitive history. I right? kind of so you know the idea that things really can sometimes turn on 
a penny. Um, and, and one of these events, actually, I was talking about a little bit in the inaugural uh, last week that some of you may have uh, come across. So in the Chinese sources, in uh, the Hu Han Shu, the Book of the Later Han, that talks about the history of the Later Han period, so in the first two centuries CE, there is a story about what happened in 166 CE. Uh, and this is when Roman traders uh, appeared and they'd arrived on the coast of what is modern day in Vietnam um, and sort of moved up into Han China and they'd been presented to the emperor. Uh, and kind of Linda saying, what if Alexander the Great hadn't risen to fame? Great, 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 what if? Absolutely, I love it. So in 166 CE, these Roman traders who had made their way all the way uh, to, to be more, what is modern day Vietnam, um, up into China, kind of were granted an audience with the emperor and they claimed to be there having been sent on official behalf of the Roman emperor himself, who's recorded in the Chinese sources as being called Andun. Now, if you mirror that across in 166 to who was Roman emperor at that point, it was Marcus Aurelius. Um, so, you know, not completely kind of off with the name. So these Roman traders claim to have come on official uh, bequest to the Roman Emperor and to be wanted there to present gifts to the Chinese Emperor. Ooh, and they presented their gifts, which were rhinoceros horn and tortoiseshell. But the reaction of the Chinese Emperor, as recorded in the sources, is extortionate. So he, uh, he says, well, these gifts are really underwhelming. I'm really unimpressed by these gifts. These are things which are fairly commonplace that we know about that come from fairly local environments. We thought the Romans, all that long distance away, we thought they had tons of gold, and coral, and pearl, and jewels, and kind of fantastically wealthy people. Up to this point in time, no Chinese uh, explorer had ever made it to the Roman world. So they, China had heard tons about the Roman world. Lots of Chinese goods has ended up in the Mediterranean Roman world. Uh, and to a certain extent, some Roman goods must have made their way to China. But uh, no one had ever kind of met the Roman and Chinese worlds face to face. And here it was supposedly happening. These Roman traders, for the first time, had turned up. And they turned up with goods which seriously unimpressed the Chinese emperor. And the with the result that, the Chinese go, hmm, perhaps reports of this fabulous Roman Empire have been over-exaggerated. Perhaps it's not such a great place after all. Uh, and after that, we hear of no further attempt by the Chinese, the Han Chinese, or indeed subsequent Chinese, ancient Chinese cultures, to make direct contact with the Roman Empire. The Romans will continue to try and make contact with China, and they eventually do in the later third centuries. Um, but uh, what if that moment had gone differently? And in fact, we, d we think it wasn't a Roman emperor sending this official embassy at all. We think it was Roman traders who were working on, working off the eastern uh, Indian coast uh, from ports like Pondicherry, who had made their way across through into the shores, through to modern Vietnam, and were chancing it, knowing that if they said they came on behalf of the Roman emperor, who could tell them that they didn't, um, they had a pretty good shot at getting uh, an official uh, um, kind of meeting with the Chinese emperor. They read the signs that China was sufficiently interested enough in Rome that this was a good ploy to try, but they didn't have the goods to back it up. They only had local trading goods. So what would have happened in history? How would the world be different if those guys had turned up with amazing goods that impressed and underscored the kind of Chinese impression of what Rome was like as a place really, really worth making direct contact with and having direct trading links with. What would the ancient world have been like? What would the modern world have been like if China and Rome had been directly connected from that point in uh, the latter half of the second century CE? Who knows? Who knows? One of those great what if moments. Thank you so much indeed. Um, Apple's Catherine Seven from Instagram for that question. So you can ask questions through any means, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Gmail, or indeed through the Facebook page and you get to catch up. Jacob, I really need Michael Scott to do a React to video playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Indeed, yes, it kind of would be great fun to kind of have a live reaction to uh, kind of some of the great work that's been coming out of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And also to talk, I think it'd be great to talk with the people who are actually the consultants for the development of that game as well kind of the uh, it would be fun to sort of see how they go about doing how they go about doing their work and, and creating that kind of virtual world that looks sufficiently like the ancient world or what we think the ancient world should look like um, for then the game to find its place within that 
And in fact, Jakob, another question that came in that I didn't get a chance to answer during the inaugural lecture um, was, uh, was from Laura Wood, and it's on this theme. So why do you think the classical world is such an enduring source of entertainment? Not just the documentaries, but in literature, film, video games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So why is the classical world such an enduring source of entertainment? And I think on the one hand, it's, it's because it's so rich of stories. Uh, kind of amazing, often mythical stories, but uh, it's a place in which storytelling and imagination can run wild. And because these stories are often mythical, and because particularly to do with the ancient Greeks, we tend to kind of imagine them within this sort of fantasy world of myth, then anything can happen. Right? That they are a, a wonderful canvas and, and kind of uh, bubble within which to, to, to which to fill with any kind of possibilities of human imagination. I mean, that's certainly why Hollywood has got particularly interested in the ancient Greek world after 2010. 2010 was the first year where big Hollywood, $100 million plus blockbuster movies, made more money for the studios via the video games associated with the movies than by actually uh, box office receipts. So, kind of in that sense, uh, uh, Hollywood's been fascinated by the idea of can you can a, a can a script idea be made into a video game ever since? And it was in the aftermath of that that we saw all those films like um, Clash of the Titans, Wrath of the Titans, all of these films set in fantasy worlds are uh, that were sort of Greek myth inspired. Because of course you can make a video game associated with that, a brilliant video game associated with. Um, so in that sense, the kind of it's the richness of the stories, the possibilities of imagination, combined with I think the sense that ancient Greece can be this kind of fantasy world um, for us where anything is possible. Uh, kind of like kind of hello Maria, how are you doing? Uh, kind of thank you so <laughs> you so from Linden St Anne's absolutely the Linden St Anne's group who uh, I'm president of the Classical Association Linden St Anne's uh, Maria and I'm very very proud to be so this fantastic organisation that's now in its fifth year um, and yes a group came down to the inaugural and I was up there just a couple of weeks before judging their uh, competition uh, for uh, for students who were giving presentations on the ancient world so an absolutely fantastic organisation. And that reminds me to talk a little bit about what's on and classics in the news. Um, what's on uh, in terms of uh, Lytham, St Anne's and classics, don't forget, they have their bursaries and they've extended their deadline. So you can go until the 8th of March to apply for up to £370 to attend the Repton Summer School um, for Classical Studies this summer. So if you're thinking about wanting to do a summer school in classics and want a bit of extra financial help, please do get in touch with them and apply for one of these bursaries. Um, have a look at lsaclassics.com. Um, then you can also, uh, kind of next, uh, next month in March, I'm going to be in Northern Ireland uh, on the 14th, um, and I'm going to be talking to, to the Classical Association branch of Northern Ireland, um, and we're going to be talking about understanding the Oracle at Delphi. So again, that's a schools-orientated event. Um, if you are at school in Northern Ireland, it would be absolutely fantastic if you could come along, or indeed from further afield, if you could make it on the day. Um, but there if you uh, want to uh, get in touch with the organiser, which is Helen McVeigh, and you that's helenmcveigh at gmail.com, and we'll put those links up as well if you'd like to reserve a place for that. Um, if you're in Greece, you can uh, head to later on September, October time, uh, talking to Homer at the Western Resort of Costa Navarino in Greece, um, a slightly more expensive uh, version. This is an exclusive six day re reading retreat uh, with multi award winning author Madeline Miller, uh, kind of thing. But the tickets will cost you 2000 over 2000 euros and so uh, if you've got that kind of money hanging around and you'd like to spend some time with Madeleine Miller it sounds absolutely fantastic in Costa Navarino um, and of course in the news and we're posting all this on the FB page um, there's been amazing stuff coming out of Pompeii again part of these Regio 5 excavations that are just turning up amazing fantastic material it seems week after week after week hello Helen you're there great to see you yes I'm looking forward to coming on the 14th hope you don't mind the call out and shout out for people if they're interested um, in coming along to the event on the 14th very very much uh, hope and uh, that people can come I'm very very much looking forward to being there to speaking and be speaking with you um, we've had the Narcissus fresco unveiled in Pompeii uh, kind of absolutely fantastic uh, the gladiator school did you see this video we posted on the Facebook page of the gladiator school absolutely fantastic absolutely worth having a look at and also on the Facebook page may I say I'm supremely impressed 
by your fantastic collections of photos that you're sending in. Please, please, please keep sending them in and we're going to put them in the photos that you've taken from classical sites around the world. Absolutely fantastic. Loving seeing them um, and seeing what are your favourite places and favourite things uh, from around the classical world. Um, so kind of keep those coming in, keep your questions coming in um, and do check out some of the things we've been flagging uh, on the Facebook page. And also I wanted to add to that as well, the Department of Classics and Ancient History at Warwick, um, we have a YouTube channel and on our YouTube channel at the moment are some of the uh, videos that our students, our undergraduate students, have been putting together in what we call the Hellies, which is our annual um, video award event just happened last week. Um, and for students taking the Hellenistic World module in our course second year, which all students take, one of the things they can do is create short videos about uh, topics within uh, the Hellenistic world. And then we have, once those videos are handed in, we have a, 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 an Oscars-like ceremony, the Hellies, to judge a winner and then we put all the videos up on our YouTube channel. So go and have a look at the Department of Classics and Ancient History YouTube channel and you can get a great sense of some of the work that our students are doing. Absolutely mind-boggling both in terms of their digital videoing skills and indeed the topics, the interesting topics that they are bringing to light from the ancient world. So get involved in that, do have a look. And next week, um, again in Warwick, some of you may be coming to this on the 6th of March. Uh, Catherine uh, is uh, one of our postgraduates, is leading a brilliant uh, day, in, again intended named at schools as part of our Warwick Classics Network initiative, which is Ancient Images Modernised, thinking about how uh, ancient images, particularly of people uh, and of the kind of perfect bodies of the ancient world, overlap with the way that we often advertise things with sort of perfect airbrushed Photoshop, Adobe Photoshopped bodies in the modern world. So do look out for some of the material on that. If you can't make it on the day, then we'll be putting up some of the material after the day um, on the Warwick Classics Network page, which is easily accessed at warwick.ac.uk forward slash WCN. And we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, and we can maybe pick up one more question. Um, Jules Smith asked after the inaugural, do I happen to have a favorite Greek myth? How can you choose? Oh, how can you choose your favorite Greek myth? The, the, the one that's kind of stuck with me the longest, I think, has to be Medusa. Um, kind of I, I, you know, utterly uncertain why, to be perfectly honest, but I, it's kind of one that just I find utterly fascinating. And uh, it will always stick with me as well, the way it was brilliantly updated in Percy Jackson and The Lightning Thief, the movie, when uh, instead of, uh, as they were trying to avoid Uma Thurman playing the Medusa character, uh, they, instead of holding up a shield to sort of reflect the image of Medusa so they weren't ever looking directly at her, um, Percy Jackson holds up uh, the silver uh, back of an iPod, uh, kind of very much bringing, up, uh, bringing it up to the 21st century um, and kind of uh, adjusting that story. And that's the great thing about myths, that they are the retelling of stories. And the whole point about them is that they should be told and retold and re-represented and updated and brought into context. That's what the ancient tragedians were doing. They were retelling myths. That's what all the great storytellers of the ancient world were doing. That's what Stephen Fry's done brilliantly recently with the Greek myths in his own personal retelling. They are stories that belong to everyone and everyone has the power to reinvent them for themselves. So kind of lots more. Come tell us about your favorite Greek myth Please let us know kind of which Greek myth you think wins out. Maybe we'll do a kind of competition to find the top the top uh, Greek myth uh, amongst uh, the kind of group uh, on the Facebook page. That would be a fun thing to do. And why? So send us in your, your thoughts on why. Uh, what is your favourite Greek myth? Okie dokie. Well, we are almost out of time. Uh, to, uh, my my uh, thought for you to, for next week is uh, we're back with the Q&A next week. We've got some great questions that we haven't had a chance to get to today, uh, but we're back next week, the Thursday, uh, Thursday the 7th of March. Uh, four o'clock, as always. Uh, maybe quite not with this jazzy background, maybe. I keep you guessing as to whether this will make an appearance again. Um, and it would be great. Please, please, please send in your questions uh, via Instagram, via Gmail, via the Facebook page. Uh, kind of, I love uh, receiving your questions and uh, thinking about how to answer them and discussing them with you here. Alison Barber talks about Daedalus and Icarus as her favourite Greek myth. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Another another great one. Uh, Sheila, thank you so much. You've enjoyed. I'm so glad that you've enjoyed the session. 
session. Um, so everyone have a lovely end to the week. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. I hope the sun is shining for you. I hope that you have a great week next week. Uh, I am deep in the marking of ancient global history essays uh, at the moment for my ancient global history modules. I'm seeing some fantastic examples of ancient global interactions stretching from the Mediterranean to ancient China. We've got some more questions about ancient global history to answer next week. But everyone have a great week and uh, we will see you next Thursday. All right, take care. Bye-bye.